Let's talk about service tags supporting user-defined routes, which is a feature that went generally available today, got announced on our Azure Updates website here. Um, this is a really quick video talking about the, the feature, the context, and some of the use cases. I'll leave all these links in the description below, so please check them out. Let's start with the basics. Well, this feature has been in public preview for about a year, and therefore lots of customers have had a chance to play with it, it's been eagerly anticipated. First question would be, well, what is a service tag? In simple terms, I like to think about it as it's a collection of IP addresses that is managed by Microsoft. So in a similar way in which things like BGP communities can represent lists of uh, prefixes being advertised, a service tag can represent a block of IP addresses that has a name and if Microsoft deems you want to change the IP addresses behind the scenes, we do that, but that has no impact on the, the customer. The customer has to make no changes. You just consume the service tag. And we got a couple of websites that explain this, aka.ms forward slash service tags. This takes you to this website, and this will talk through the more service specific side of service tags and how they've been used in the past with network security groups. Also mention some of the feature support here and then gives you some links to the, the downloads page, which is here. I'll leave the link below so you can download this. It updates so in the past. This updated on a regular basis and the forewarning of IP has been updated was important for customers because before service tags, you would have to manually maintain these lists yourselves and, and take responsibility for them being in sync and the the big step here is you don't have to do that anymore. Also, there is a platform provided API where you can query the IP address contents of a particular service tag. And there's also a couple of third party websites out there where you can do the same thing. Again, I'll leave links below. So one example is this website here. And this does a quite nice job of, of updating the service tags and giving you a nice breakdown. So for example, you could click on the high level Azure Cloud, which is every IP address used by Azure. And you could drill into, for example, Azure Cloud inside of Australia East, and that would give you a list of IP addresses. If I look at a VPN gateway here that I've got in UK South, I've got this IP address. It's telling me that, hey, this service here lives inside of UK South. It's part of that, that prefix. And this website here provides the same thing. You see it's a member of Azure Cloud, the, the parent service tag. It's also a member of UK South. What is a UDR? Well, in simple terms, a UDR is a static route in Azure. It lets you define a parameter to match on. And in the past, that's been IP addresses that you define, ranges or blocks, subnets. And uh, now we can also use service tags, which as we've described are these placeholders or, or tags that Microsoft manage that represent IP addresses. So how does that look in the portal? Well, here's an example of a, a UDR that uses IP addresses, kind of the old old fashioned way. It's me defining a particular block of IPs there. Well, in a similar fashion, we can define a service tag. So in this example, I'm saying for all of the IP addresses that Microsoft deem represent Azure storage in West Europe, route to my virtual appliance. And there's different types of next hop here we can specify. The main ones which will be making use of this feature in a sort of a complementary way would be internet and virtual appliance as we'll talk about later. Okay, so we know what the UDR is, we know what a service tag is. Why do these make sense together? First of all, when do we used to specify the list of IP addresses inside of UDRs, you can imagine if you were a customer trying to keep in sync a list of IP addresses such as this and do that in a manual way in which you updated it, then you would very quickly hit a limit in terms of the number of UDR entries that you could specify. In fact, we had a limit of 400 on the platform. However, now when you, when you insert a single entry with a, a service tag, that only counts as one line. So it greatly simplifies your UDR complexity and helps you stay within platform limits. 
And as I said, they are managed by Microsoft. And that means that we can make a backend change for a system dependency, which should have uh, no requirement for you to change anything. So we can do that in a non-impacting way behind the scenes. And it's a, a better experience for everybody involved. Right, let's think about some scenarios where this could be used. The first one we'll look at is kind of, uh, let's say, customer scenario based. Let's think about a scenario where we want to override a forced tunneling from on-premises. So let's hop over, to, hop over to our diagram here. So imagine you've got an on-premises DMZ still, a physical DMZ, and you're sending all traffic out to the internet from your on-prem physical DMZ. And you also are applying that methodology for all of your traffic from Azure. So you, you're forced tunneling traffic by advertising a default route into Azure. So you, you advertise a, a 000 route in this direction, which has the effect of sucking all traffic almost as a gateway of last resort back to your on-prem DMZ uh, before you route traffic out to the internet. Now, we generally, we, we generally recommend you avoid this pattern all up, but there are some scenarios where, where you have to do it or you have to do it on a temporary basis. And one of the things that you may decide to do using service tags is the following. So let's say that this red line is attracting all VM traffic via Express Route Gateway out to the, the internet. And your NVA is also learning a that that same route so it's also learning that it should send traffic there so even if your vm sends traffic to your mva even if you disable bgp route propagation on the spoke and your vm sends traffic to your mva your mva has been affected by that default route now in the past you could have come on that nva and said actually i want to define a an override and say zero 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 with next hop internet, which would have a an overriding effect on all traffic. It would have basically overridden the red line with a, let's say a blue line. And then we send all traf traffic out to the internet and that completely bypasses the on-prem DMZ. However, what if you only want to do that bypass for traffic destined to Azure? Well, that's where the, the service tag scenario comes in. So now we can define a match of service tag Azure Cloud with next hop internet. And let's think about what, what that does. Well, it will look at the destination of the packet coming from the VM. And if that destination is an IP address located on Azure, it will let the NVA route the traffic out directly with Nextop internet, which drops it onto the Microsoft backbone and then keeps it on the Microsoft network and routes it to the appropriate Microsoft service. If it doesn't match that service tag, for example, it's routing traffic out to a random public site on the internet uh, that's hosted outside of Azure, then that's where the, the red line would still be used in this scenario. So that traffic could still be routed back to your on-prem DMZ and out to the internet. Now, whether or not this is actually suitable for your security policy is a separate discussion because one of the main gotchas with this pattern is that the Azure Cloud service tag, it not only includes all of the Microsoft PaaS services, but it includes every public IP on Azure. And of course, there are many other customers hosting their own websites and services on Azure. So by implementing this blue line via the NVA, you would in effect be routing traffic to any other customer on Azure directly. And as I say, that may or may not meet your requirements. It would certainly be routing the traffic in an efficient way. And as long as you have your required security intent defined on your, your firewall in the cloud, then that would work. So this, this provides potentially a stepping stone approach to migrate in your DMZ from on-prem into the cloud. And by that, I mean, maybe step one is you use this service tag. So you move Azure destined traffic to the cloud. And then when you're finally ready to move everything for all public traffic, 
you stop advertising that default route. What if the Azure Cloud service tag is too wide ranging for you? Well, that's where the more specific tags kick in. Remember the tag that I used in my UDR, which was storage.west Europe. If I replace that with storage.westeurope, then the only traffic which I would bypass my on-prem DMZ for would be traffic going to Azure Storage in West Europe. So as long as the PaaS service that you want to apply that routing intent for is captured by a service tag, you can see you can implement that sort of granular uh, routing using the service tag combined with the next top internet on an NVA. One pattern that we've seen this feature being used for, and it's worth mentioning, is if you happen to have public IPs on premises. So there are some customers that over a period of many, many years, decades perhaps, have grown their on-prem network and their on-prem network is existing from a time where using public IPs on internal networks was sometimes done to get around uh, IPv4 starvation, things like that. So for example, you could be using on-premises IP block 128.0.0.0.2. The effect of that would be if you're using express route, this block of public IPs would get advertised into Azure over Express Route, and everything inside of Azure would want to route traffic for this on-premises public IP block out to uh, your on-prem network. The customers that have this challenge to wrangle with the use of public IPs within their on-prem network find that sometimes the public IPs that they use on-prem overlap with public IPs used inside of Azure. So the, the all of the, you know, the many, many blocks that Microsoft use inside of Azure, these, these two blocks might clash. Uh, and what that means is if, if that customer is using this public IP address range on-prem, they could end up effectively attracting traffic to on-prem, which is destined for an Azure cloud service. And there's been cases where traffic going to Azure public service gets sort of sucked into a black hole because of this. And this service tag for UDR feature can help get around that by doing the same thing we just presented. It can say for everything going to service tag Azure Cloud, effectively any IP address in the Microsoft range, route it out with next top internet, effectively, effectively bypass my route that I'm advertising from on-prem. Okay, we've covered the, the examples for where customers might want to use it, but it's also worth acknowledging that Microsoft make use of this feature in how they offer private PaaS services to customers. So at a high level with private PaaS services, there's two categories, and we won't drill into this too much in this video, but uh, there's the sort of PaaS services that live outside of the VNet, things like Azure SQL, Azure Storage, where we use tools like Private Link to get out in a private way. And then there are services that can get chunked up and live inside of a customer VNet, but they're still managed by Microsoft. And these are things like Azure Firewall, Virtual Network Gateway, HD Insights, Databricks, Data Factory, uh, and SQL Manage Instance is an example of one of those services. Deploy it into your virtual network so you see the sort of the, the nodes that make up SQL and MI live in the VNet under your control, but the service is managed by Microsoft. So the control plane lives outside your VNet, but the actual data plane of the service lives inside your VNet. And the thing in which we use to bridge the gap there uh, and lock down the, the management function, that's where uh, this feature again can help. And, and let me show you what I mean by that. So if we look at this is the documentation for SQL Managed Instance network requirements. We see down here uh, with SQL MI, what happens is you you get the the Managed Instance subnet inside of your inside of your VNet, 
you see it in your subscription, but it has the sort of networking rights delegated to to Microsoft to manage, as we'll see in a, in a separate screen in a second. The it says here the service will automatically provision and keep current entries required to allow uninterrupted flow of traffic of management traffic. So that means it can be locked down very securely, but we can still allow traffic in and out to the to the uh, the management address space that represents the SQL management for Microsoft. So here we've got a a new deployment of SQL MI, and this is the uh, the route table that gets that gets deployed. We can take a look at it. So let's have a look at the routes. So for example, there's a route here that's generated by the system, and you can see the address prefix. It's not an IP address. It's a service tag. So SQL management is a service tag managed by Microsoft, which had been routed straight out to the internet. What that means is that the SQL MI service that lives in your VNet is guaranteed to route out directly in not only an optimal way, but a required way to make sure it comes from the right public IP when it's talking to the control plane. And that means it will survive any sort of forced tunneling that you're doing, any sort of other network intent that you've deployed on your network will coexist with the requirement for the, the service to uh, talk outbound. And you know, we can we could have a look at that SQL management service tag, for example, uh, and see what IP addresses it constitutes. So behind the scenes, the network intent, the network logic is Microsoft have deemed all of these complex IP addresses to be what represents SQL MI. So that all of this complexity now uh, is, is abstracted away from you as the customer with that single one line item.